ministry, we have commissioned them as apostles. Can we give a hand for them? Just thank God for that. And uh, just want to just commend them for their faithfulness because the last time I was here, we were meeting in the mall in a different place and we had a commissioning service. Last time I saw them, they were on the ground, just out in the spirit. And uh, this church has multiplied a number of times since then. And truly, it's harvest time in the Philippines. It is harvest time. It's harvest time around the world. You may not know this, but uh, based on this encyclopedia that comes out every 10 years, uh, is edited by a man named Dave Barrett. And the last one came out in 2010. Since then, he's gone home to be with the Lord. But he estimates around 200,000 people are getting saved every single day globally, including 35,000 in China every day. I was just in Guangzhou. I just got here from Guangzhou to Manila. And truly, the harvest is just amazing. They estimate maybe around 120 million believers, more believers in China now than in the United States. And so we're seeing a great harvest in China. We're seeing in India, 30,000, 35,000 getting saved every single day. And um, Indonesia, the largest Muslim nation in the world, is now 35% born again. Can we thank Jesus for that? Now, <laughs> you know, I was sharing that um, at our conference, and Mel Torrey happened to be uh, in our service, and he's an Indonesian evangelist. And he came up to me after the service, and he said, um, Che, I just want to speak the truth and love to you. I think your estimation of 35,000, I mean 35% of Indonesia, I thought he was going to say is way exaggerated, but he said is way too low. It's a lot more than 35% of Indonesia. So God is on the move. I found this out from another Muslim who converted to a follower of Jesus. And he told me that 20 million Muslims are getting saved every single year. Can we thank the Lord for that? And, and so we're living the most exciting time. We're seeing history before us. As a Korean, for those who don't know, I'm Korean. And uh, let me just tell you real quickly how to tell the difference between a Korean, Chinese, and Japanese. Can I just give you some cross-cultural lesson here? So very, very simple. If you see a rich-looking nature and they're Chinese, all the businessmen in Manila are Chinese. If you see a smart-looking nation, they're Japanese. They take whatever we invent in the United States and make it better. If you see a handsome-looking Asian, he's Korean. So that's how you tell the difference between... <laughs> just joking. But uh, my wife actually is very, very beautiful Filipina. We have four adult children. And uh, my son is 38 and my youngest is 32. We had four children in six years. We call that church growth, by the way. So <laughs> you want to be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth. And, um, and two of them are pastors. They all love Jesus. Uh, two of them are stay-at-home moms with uh, three and two children, respectfully. And I have five grandchildren. And my prayer is more Lord. <laughs> I want more grandchildren. Uh, everything they say about being a grandparent is true. Uh, how many grandparents do we have here? Yes. Amen. And so we are so blessed. I am so blessed uh, having so much fun uh, with my family serving the Lord. This is a very special month for me because uh, May 29th, say May 29th. May 29th is my spiritual birthday. I know with Pastor Rachel, you had your birthday yesterday. Happy birthday again. Uh, but uh, I was born again May 29th, 1973. This coming May 29th will be my 45th spiritual birthday. I, it, yeah, glory to God. I was a drug addict. I was a drug pusher. And I was at a Deep Purple concert. Now, I know you don't know who they are, but Deep Purple was the number one heavy metal band back in 1973 with the music smoke on the water. And I had an encounter with the Lord at the concert of the Baltimore Civic Center. 15,000 young people, all these hippies, packed into the Civic Center to hear the number one band in the world, and they were from England. And in the middle of the intermission, I had an encounter with Jesus, and the Lord spoke to me, if you want to follow me, you have to throw away your drugs, leave this concert, and follow me. Now, I don't have time to go into the details of it, but it was an incredible, powerful encounter. So I threw away my drugs. I left the concert, 15,000 people. I had to find my way out of that crowd because they were all standing, pressing in towards the stage. But when I walked out of that concert hall, 
it was actually a civic center, May 29th, 1973, I got instantly delivered from drug addiction, and I've been set free, and I've been free ever since, glory to God. Everyone who knows me know that's true. I've never gone back, never backslide. How many know you don't have to backslide as a believer? How many know the Bible says we go from glory to glory, that we're transformed into his image from glory to glory, 2 Corinthians 3, 18. And that's why we gather together like this every week, because you encounter the presence of the Holy Spirit and the worship. How many know the presence is here? It is here. I'm not just saying this prophetically. It is so manifest here. It's very, very strong in the Philippines. Again, you guys are experiencing revival, and you don't know how blessed you are because I go to nations, and um, it is like pulling teeth. I mean, uh, can I just be honest? I go to Europe, and if we have just 100 people show up, it's a good meeting. And uh, it's just like <laughs> it is so hard for them to get on fire for the Lord. And so here you are experiencing an incredible wave of revival in the Philippines. And it's for a purpose. I love this young man who prayed. He prayed everything <laughs> that needed to be prayed. He prayed for North Korea, South Korea, he prayed for Jerusalem, he prayed for your country, he prayed for uh, you know, homosexuality to be broken, same sex. I mean, he covered everything in a short time. And, uh, but but what, what he said was is that you have a prophetic destiny and that you would fulfill your prophetic destiny. Right. See, the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is required. And if God is pouring out his blessing upon you, it is for the purpose of taking that blessing to the nations. Can I hear an amen? Yes. So we can't be selfish with it. Listen, America right now is the number one mission sending, mission giving nation, period. But I believe the center of gravity is shifting from the United States to Asia. I believe that Asians will be the number one mission sending, mission giving. I'm talking about the Philippines. I'm talking about China. I'm talking about Korea, yeah. right? Yeah. And so, uh, and in fact, Korea per capita is the number one mission giving, mission sending nation. But you know, Korea has 45 million, United States over 300 million. And so per capita, they're giving a lot. And wherever you go around the world, you run into Korean missionaries. And, and so, I, and I travel around the world, so I see them all the time. They come up to me, think I can speak Korean, and I can't. In fact, I met a, <laughs> it's very humbling. I could hardly speak English, yet alone Korean and English. And so, uh, but uh, I grew up in the United States. My dad was the first Southern Baptist pastor in North America, 1958. And there were hardly any Koreans in uh, the United States at that time. It was right after the Korean War. The Korean War, the ceasefire took place in 1953. And technically, we're still at war between North and South. And that's why it's such a big deal. And I know the summit in Singapore was uh, postponed, but we need to continue to pray. We need to continue to pray that North and South Korea will be unified because God loves North Korea. He desires all to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth, right? First Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. And so... You know, that nation is a hermit nation. It is so closed off. Uh, Christians have been persecuted. Um, thank God, just recently, North Korea released three American missionaries. They're professors at a technology school in North Korea. And that school was established by Christian business people. And, um, and so they were in prison, um, one for several years, the other two for the last year. And so they're released. But... I am believing God that God is going to open up North Korea. And right now we have around 500 churches, HIM churches in South Korea. So I've been speaking to them. We meet every year for our HIM conference. And we're really encouraging them, get ready. Because we need to plant thousands of churches in North Korea. Amen. And I want you to be part of that. I want you to sow into that. And whatever we're doing at HIM globally, you're part of our global family of love and affection. I want to talk to you. Uh, I have a word on my heart that I just shared with my church uh, just right before I left on the church uh, on this trip. So it's not a message I've spoken on uh, in my travels. So again, uh, I use my home church as my guinea pig. You know what I mean? If it works at home, then I export it. But, uh, but it's something that uh, the Lord's been really speaking to me about. And I want to talk about doing life from a position of rest. Okay, so think about that, doing life from a position of rest. 
And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, let's go there in verse 28. Come to me all who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you what? Rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy, my burden's light. There's still a yoke to wear because he still is Lord. But of all the things he could say about himself, he said, I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart. That word gentleness, the word meekness, does not mean weakness. It means strength under control. It's just like a stallion, stallion maybe a thoroughbred racehorse. Very powerful, but when it's trained and broken, it could be used by the rider to go wherever the rider wants that horse to go. But he says, I'm humble in heart. And I, I so love uh, Pastor Rachel's confession of just saying, you know, I was proud. I thought it was my money. I earned it. And, um, you know, and, and she was so right. It's not our money. Psalm 24, verse 1 says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and those who live within. How many know you're the Lord's as well? Amen? Because you're those who live in this world. Everything is God's. We're just stewards. And so the way we come into rest is through humility. And I want to talk about that in a moment, but I don't want to get ahead of myself because I want to share with you how God is a God of rest. I mean, just think of the creation narrative. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. God worked six days and he rested on the seventh. He blessed that day. And he said, this day is holy. He sanctified it. He set it apart. Now, this is before the law, so there's nothing to do with... There are two institutions that took place before the law that got incorporated into the law. One is the Sabbath. The other one is tithing. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, and Abraham is the father of our faith. He was setting an example for you and for me. If you want an Old Testament theology for the basis of, of tithing that has nothing to do with the law that got incorporated into the law... He ties to Melchizedek. Who was Melchizedek? The writer of Hebrews says he was the prince of peace, the king of righteousness, who had no lineage. Only Jesus is eternal. Amen. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld, it, beheld his glory, full of grace and truth. Jesus said before Abraham was born, I am. See, he never had a beginning. So Melchizedek is a type of Christ. He's a, what we call, theologically speaking, a Christophany, where Jesus appears in the Old Testament, and the father of our faith took everything and tithed to Jesus. And so as his children, we follow his example, and we tithe. Now, that's a separate message. I'm not, I don't want to go on a rabbit trail to talk about tithing, but, but the two institutions, Sabbath and tithing, now, I don't know if you know this, but there's 631 laws in the Old Testament. That's a lot of laws. And it gets overwhelming. Most of them are ceremonial laws. A lot of it doesn't apply to us. But the 631 has been reduced down to 10 in Exodus chapter 20. We call that what? Someone said the Ten Commandments. Think about it. 631 reduced to 10. And we prayed. This, our brother who prayed, he said, Lord, forgive us. For homosexuality, how many know the Bible says thou shalt not commit adultery in the Ten Commandments? And that's under the whole genre of sexual immorality, whether it's fornication, whether it's adultery, whether it's homosexuality. That is a big one. That's why we don't compromise on that one. Can I hear an amen? amen. And so I want you singles to be pure before Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. You could be holy as he is holy. Amen. amen. And then the other one, murder. Thou shalt not murder. That's in the top ten. That's why in this country, I thank God that you don't believe in abortion. You believe that abortion is murder. And so in my country, we are trying to reverse this terrible law that was passed in 1973 called Roe versus Wade. And we're trying to reverse it. And uh, it's amazing because there's a shift in American society. Back 10 years ago, only 38% of Americans were pro-life. Today, 52%. And it's growing and it's increasing. And you know who's leading the way is young people. It's the millennials. 
And here's the reason why, because of technology and science. I don't know, you know, my kids, I have five grandchildren. Each one could get a 3D sonogram, three-dimensional sonogram. And when you see it, you say, this is a life. This is not just mass tissues. This is a human being. And with the science uh, improving, with the uh, viability outside the womb, uh, life being able to exist at a younger, younger stage, they're realizing that this is a human being. So there's a shift going on. And listen, transformation begins with the renewing of your mind. Amen. We're transformed by the renewal of our mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, right? And so we're seeing this happen in America. And, uh, and our uh, belief is that through, uh, thank God for President Trump. Uh, you may not like him, but he is a pro-life president. We have a pro-life Senate. We have a pro-life cabinet members and House of Representatives. And for the first time, I see light at the end of the tunnel that we can overturn Roe v. Wade and see revival and reformation in our nation. And you can see the same thing here, whatever your issues are. Don't limit the Holy One of Israel in your, in your nation. Amen. So we're living a very exciting time. And so we see that those are big ones in the Ten Commandments. But right in the middle of it, in Exodus chapter 20, it says you're to honor the Lord with the Sabbath, for it is holy unto the Lord. A lot of times we don't think the Sabbath is as big as thou shalt not murder, or thou shalt not commit adultery, or thou shalt have no other gods before me. You should honor your father and mother, etc. But it's up there. It's one of the top ten. Why? See, the Sabbath, Jesus said this, is not for for, it's not man is for the Sabbath, but Sabbath is for man, is for your benefit. God blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified that day. And as we align with him and we set aside that day to rest, we get blessed. Now listen to me, some of you are resting already, you're sleeping as I'm preaching, so that, you know, I appreciate you taking this literally, but... <laughs> But it's not just physical rest. See, I want to just talk about rest is not just the absence of stress, anxiety, fear. It is that. But it's not just that. It is on the positive side, the manifest presence of God that can transform your life. The whole purpose of the Sabbath, the Lord says, I want you to honor me on this day because I want you to draw near to me. It's James 4, verse 8, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. So the Sabbath is, well, I'll just have a day off and I'll just flesh out, watch television, I'll sleep in, play some golf, whatever. I mean, there's nothing wrong with any of that. But there's a higher purpose of the Sabbath. See, the way we're changed is through encounter. Say encounter. encounter. You're, the encounter of the Holy Spirit is what changes you. You're transformed from glory to glory by being in His presence. And God has predestined that you be conformed into the image of his son, Romans 8, 29. Yes. You're to be like Jesus. Yes. You know what's an amazing verse? 1 John 4, 17 says, as he was in the world, so are you. Right. Whatever Jesus was, you are here to represent Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Yes. This is a true story of a pastor who passed away now. But he was in Grand Central Station in New York City. And if you know that about that train station, is a very famous train station, very busy, a lot of people. And this pastor had to catch a train to go to a city, and by accident, he hid a little boy who had a lunchbox, a metal lunchbox, full of marbles. And as he hit his lunchbox, the marbles scattered all over Grand Central Station. Wow. Now, he had a choice. He could have said, sorry, kid, I'm late. I'm going to miss my train. It was an accident. I just go on. Or he could stop and collect the marbles and miss his train. He decided to collect the marbles. And as he started to pick up the marbles, other people gathered and people would start to help and people stopped. And, and, and so finally the marbles were all collected, put into that metal lunchbox and he gave it to that little boy. Do you know what the boy said? This is a true story because this is a pastor who shared this story. He said, Mr. Are you Jesus? What does Jesus look like? As he was in the world, so are you now. You represent Jesus here on earth. And it's amazing, you know, who he would use us. So imperfect, so flawed. So yeah, because it's Christ in you, 
the hope of glory. Colossians 1.27, you are carriers of the glory of God. Amen. Second Peter, verse 3 says, you are partakers of his divine nature. Yeah. Tell the person next to you, you have his divine nature. Go ahead, say that. As hard as it believes that Jesus is in you, but it's true. That's how you become born again. His spirit comes inside you and takes your dead spirit. Mine was dead because of drugs and selfishness, and he made it alive together in Christ by grace. You're saved through faith, not that of yourself. It is a gift of God. Come on, let's thank Jesus for his grace that has changed our lives. So God says, if you honor me and have a day where you draw closer to me, because as you do that, I'm going to change you from glory to glory. I'm going to make you more like me. You're going to smell like him. Have you ever smelled perfume that was just terrible perfume, cheap perfume? <laughs> Rachel knows. <laughs> Girls know about this. I mean, cheap perfume, it just comes on strong and you know, you just don't like it because if you hug them, you smell that cheap perfume on yourself. But fine perfume, expensive perfume, is a very subtle smell. And when you walk into the room, people can smell that. And when you leave, they can still smell that. It stays. So you are to be that fragrant aroma. When you walk in and you walk out, people are going to say, who was that person? What was different about that person? You are the light of the world. Yeah. You're the sod of the earth. And God wants to so transform you that without even having to say, of course, we still have to preach. Because how could they believe without hearing? How could they hear without a preacher? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news? Romans chapter 10, verse 14, right? But at the core of who you are, whether you like it or not, you're a witness. I don't know if you know that. You're a witness. You're a witness either for Jesus or against him, depending on your Christ-like character. If you say, I'm a witness for Jesus, and you're yelling at your spouse, yelling at your kids, impatient. I used to be very, very impatient. You know, Koreans, we have this thing called bali bali. That's Korean word for hurry, hurry. <laughs> I mean, I hate lines. <laughs> I'm the type of person when I go to a Walmart, do you have Walmart here? I don't know. Grocery store, anything, you know, I'll look for the shortest line. And always, that is the longest line. You know what I mean? Something goes wrong with the some, you know, customer up ahead of me. They have problems with the cashier or whatever. Why? Why? Because God is developing patience in me. It's interesting. James 1 says, let patience have his perfect course that you may be perfect, lacking in nothing. It's almost like patience is the indicator of how Christ-like you are. And so, God, I, I wish... I wish we could just lay hands on each other and receive patience, an impartation of patience, you know what I mean? But there's no such thing. You know? I mean, we would have a conference sold out, impartation of patience conference. People would come just to receive an impartation, and we would be transformed. But it doesn't work that way. God allows you to drive down Etza Highway to develop patience. During rush hour, that's what he does, right? And so you have to rejoice and count it all joy when you encounter various trials, the word says in James chapter 1. And so God is after character. And so the Sabbath is for transformation. Say transformation. He wants you to be transformed into his image. Now, I want to just share a testimony with you because I want to just share with you my, my little bit of my testimony, my background. But I began to realize in 1994, how driven I was. Because, um, you know, I, I didn't understand rest. I didn't understand, see, to me, it's not just lack of stress and anxiety, but it's moving in his spirit, moving prophetically. I love the river of God because the river of God, Ezekiel 47, as Ezekiel was led into the river by the angel, he went knee deep, ankle deep, knee deep, waist deep, but the river was so fast, it was so deep, the current so strong, he couldn't even swim across it. And what that's a picture of is total surrender. 
And so God had to teach me about surrender in 1994 because I was basically, um, you know, just trying to do things in the arm of the flesh. So let me give you a little bit of my background. I shared with you, I was a high school dropout. I was a drug addict. Now, I don't know if you know, but in the Asian culture, especially in the Korean culture, probably true in the Filipino culture, but dropping out of school is the unpardonable sin. <laughs> the whole purpose of immigrating to the United States was for us to get an education. And so my dad, you know, uh, was the first Southern Baptist pastor in North America, and um, he applied for the job. The Southern Baptist picked him, and it was amazing. It was an amazing door for us to come to the United States, 1958. And so uh, my dad just stressed to us, you have to be the top of your class. You have to study hard. You have to get straight A's. How many of you had parents like that? Come on, you know what I'm talking about. And so my, my sister was a straight A student. She never got a B in her life. She was a valedictorian of her high school, number one in her class. She got accepted to Harvard, Radcliffe, Smith College, and she picked Smith because that was the school, that was the hot school back in those days. So, you know, top, brilliant student. Now, my brother, same thing. He never got a B, straight A student, and uh, he went to Duke University. You know, he got accepted to Ivy League schools, but he picked Duke because he liked sports and he liked Duke's basketball <laughs> games and so he could go to these games for free. But I had to cheat just to get C's. How many of you can relate to what I'm doing? <laughs> and I was a high school dropout and I just partied. My brain was so fried on LSD. My main drug I took was LSD and I sold LSD. I had a friend of mine who actually had an LSD factory in his dorm room at University of Maryland. And so this thing is a hallucinogenic that controls your mind and you just hallucinate and that's how you party. But what it does is kill millions of brain cells. You know, my vocabulary was reduced to one word. Wow. <laughs> Maybe two words, wow, man. And I could even say wow backwards, wow. I was so smart. <laughs> yeah. And so when I got saved, all of a sudden, you know, I wanted to get right with my parents. I want to go back to school. I was a dropout. And so when I got saved, my dad didn't believe I was saved. Because I was such a con artist. I was such a liar, but yeah, pathological liar. I was a drug pusher and I had to lie to just get away from getting busted all the time. There was always a cover up, right? So my dad didn't think I was really saved. So I'm thinking to myself, what can I do to show him that I'm really born again? And I heard the Lord speak to me, get a haircut. <laughs> now, I hadn't cut my hair for three and a half years. My hair was down. I don't know if you've ever seen Todd White's hair. It was long like that. I didn't cut it for three and a half years. And so I went and got a haircut. And when my dad came home from work, he said, OK, I believe. <laughs> you really did give your life to Jesus Christ. <laughs> But I went back to school. And I couldn't believe how far behind I was. You know, I dropped out my junior year, and now, you know, um, I went back to school just remaining few months of my junior year because I got saved in May, and so it was actually like a month of school left in June. Then I enrolled in my senior year, and I was so far behind. But you know, the Asian culture was really influenced by Confucius' philosophy of hard work study. And, uh, you know, I type A personality on top of that. So I worked my butt off to get to, <laughs> I'm not talking about to get straight A's. I'm just talking about graduate. <laughs> I worked my butt off just to graduate and to get into University of Maryland, which I got in by the skin of my teeth, right? Because I had partied all those high school years, teen years. So now I'm in school. And now I'm a conscientious Christian, and I want to do well for his glory, for his honor. But I kicked into this incredible study mode. And, and to be honest with you, that carried over into ministry. Now, my dad, I just I want to give you as an example, my dad never took a vacation. He never took a day off. He never honored the Lord with the Sabbath. His Sabbath was Sunday, and he worked on Sunday. He preached on Sunday. And... Um, and my parents, my dad was a pastor on weekends, but he was also a dental technician. He was bivocational. 
So he worked Monday through Friday, and then he pastored on the weekends. So we never took a family vacation. And so here I am now, married, 1979, involved in vocational full-time ministry, and I was a workaholic, just working 60, 70 hours a week. Now, we had a day off, but in reality, it wasn't a day off because I would do counseling, I would do message preparation, I would do a lot of things uh, involved in ministry, even though it was supposed to be a, a Sabbath for me. And then I was called to Los Angeles in 1984 and we moved to LA. We knew no one there. Now I came out of a large church. I was not the senior pastor. I was the associate pastor of a 3,000 member church. And so when I came out to California, I thought the same thing was gonna happen, that we would see tremendous growth and um, souls will be saved and God promised me revival. But the first six months of our church plant, we had 20 people. And that included my kids and Lou Engel's kids. <laughs> we call that church growth again, you know? So it wasn't really happening. And so I kicked into this workaholic gear. And you know what I did? Literally, I knocked, Bishop, I knocked on every door in Pasadena. I was like a Jehovah's Witness, even though I'm not a Jehovah's Witness, I knocked on every door to evangelize. 100,000 people in Pasadena just to see the harvest come in. See, sometimes we try to do things in the arm of the flesh and we get into trouble. What is the arm of the flesh? Remember, God gave Abraham a promise that I'm going to give you a promised child. And you're going to be a father of many. And even though he was old and Sarah was old, they received this prophetic promise. And so after waiting and, you know, he receives his promise when he's 75 and years go by, Still nothing happened. So, so Sarah says, listen, why don't you have a relationship with Hagar, my handmaiden? Maybe that's the way this prophetic word is to come to pass. And so Abraham has a relationship with Hagar and Ishmael is born. It's like the spirit of stupid came upon Abraham and Sarah. Because to this day, the children of Ishmael are the Arab people and they hate the children of Isaac, Israel. They're at war to this day. So that's what the arm of the flesh will do. When you get ahead of God and you try to make things happen, I want to give you a verse right now that has changed my life. It's Zechariah 4, 6. Zechariah 4, 6, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. In other words, not by your might, not by your power, but by my spirit. Psalm 127 says it this way, unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor, labor in vain. And so we try to do things and we try to do life. We try to even do ministry in our own strength. And God says, no way. This is not rest. Right. See, even going into the promised land, it's really interesting. When Joshua went into the promised land, God said, when you come into the promised land, you will come into rest. And I'm sure Joshua was asking, are you kidding me? You just told us to take Jericho. You want us to take Ai. You want us to conquer all the pagans, destroy their cities. That doesn't sound like rest. It sounds like perpetual war. But God says, I have a different way. I want you to do it. I want you to go to Jericho. And I want you to march around Jericho once a day for six days. Then on the seventh day, I want you to march around seven times. I want the Levites, I want the, the priests to lead the way, carrying the Ark of the Covenant. And at, on the seventh day, at the seventh time, I want them to blow the trumpet, and then I want you to give a big shout. And the walls of Jericho are going to come down, and you are to go right into the city and destroy everything in the city. It's the first fruit, by the way, first fruit city. Everything belongs to the Lord. How many of you know this is not written in West Point, in our military academy, on how to take a city for God. How many of you know this sounds ridiculous? So God says, my ways are not your ways. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. Yes, I'm going to ask you to do some work, but it's a different kind of work. Yeah. It's a different kind of work where it's allowing me to supernaturally move on your behalf, allow me to part the Jordan River, allow me to take the walls of of uh, uh, Jericho down, allow me to hold the sun still yeah. as you defeat AI. That's right. This is the way he wants us to work. And not by your might, 
not by your power, but by his spirit. And I tell you, when you allow the spirit to do it, it just will blow everything else away. So here, I'm working hard, going to school at the same time, getting my master of divinity at Fuller Seminary, get my doctor of ministry at Fuller Seminary, eight years in cemetery, I mean in seminary, <laughs> studying away, typical Korean, you know, workaholic, you know, type A, doing all the stuff I can do, growing a church. But something happened in 1992, and again, um, I wrote about it in two of my books. I don't have time to go into the background, but for various reasons, I resigned from my church, not because of moral failure or anything like that. It was really disagreement with the founding apostle of the church planting movement uh, because he didn't believe in the kingdom. I mean, he just, you know, I was the chairperson for March for Jesus in our city, and he asked me to resign. He said, we don't want to march with these liberal pastors and women pastors and all. I mean, it was just ridiculous reason. Long story short, so I resigned from uh, the movement, not from March for Jesus. I resigned from the movement. And so 1992, I was without work. I was unemployed. And, um, you know, we were really wondering if we should sell our house in Pasadena, California, uh, because when you don't have a job, you have a mortgage, you have four children going into their teen years. It's very expensive in Los Angeles. And I was realizing, you know what, I have to provide for my family, and I'm not doing a good job providing. I need to go into the marketplace. So I'm going through all this discouragement. For the first time in 1993, I was depressed. You know how depressed I was? I had to exercise faith just to move from depression to discouragement. How many know that's pretty bad? And so I was depressed. I wanted to quit maybe ministry altogether and go into the marketplace. But something happened. I want to encourage you. Psalm 30 says, weeping may last through the night, but joy comes in the morning. You may be going through a, a sorrow or weeping time right now in the season you're going through, but just hang in there because joy is going to come in the morning. Amen. And so what happened was is that the Holy Spirit fell in Toronto, January 20th, 1994, Toronto, Canada. Revival broke out. But people don't realize it also fell in Los Angeles. And uh, I became born again again. I, I was experiencing things I never experienced before in my life. For example, we were in a conference where I experienced it was at the vineyard with John Wimber, the late John Wimber. It was a leadership conference with 4,000 people. It was a conference on healing, January 25th, 1994. And during the worship, people start to laugh. And uh, I didn't even pick it up because I'm worshiping the Lord, and, but Lou Engel was with me. He's a prophet, and he nudges me and said, hey, Jay, the laughter's coming towards us. We were all the way in the balcony, at the top of the balcony, the far left-hand corner. And he said, look, the, the Holy Spirit's hitting each section. People are laughing. Now, I've been part of the charismatic movement since 1974. I spoke in tongues in 74, but we never experienced holy laughter. And I didn't understand holy laughter. So I said, I'm not going to laugh. <laughs> I just said that. I'm not going to laugh. I, I thought it was just some sociological thing that was going on. But God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when I was dead in my depression, when the Holy Spirit fell on our section up in the balcony, I felt myself getting drunk. I used to get drunk, but now I'm feeling myself getting drunk in the spirit. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I wanted to laugh. But I didn't want to laugh because I didn't want Lou to see me laughing, so I put my hand over my mouth. And I was just trying to hold back the laughter, but it was just so effervescent, it just bubbled up. And finally, I couldn't stop laughing, and I laughed for a good 15 minutes. This is during worship. No one's speaking anything. No one's telling a joke up front. This is just the Holy Spirit making us drunk. And I remember there was a guy sitting in front of me. He was bald. He had no hair. For whatever reason, his bald head looked so funny... Forgive me for those who are bald. I, I don't mean to offend anyone. But I leaned over and I started to massage his bald head. Total stranger. He didn't care because he was drunk in the spirit as well. <laughs> We're just laughing. I fall out of my seat. I'm on the ground just laughing. I said, what is this? And after around 15, 20 minutes, I stopped laughing. And I realized my depression was gone. It just had lifted. 
I don't know, but what does joy look like if it doesn't include laughter? The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, Romans 14, 17, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Come on. Some of you look like you could use more joy. You don't look too happy. As I'm looking out here, you don't look, you look like you're wearing tight underwear. You don't look too comfortable. <laughs> but what does joy look like if it doesn't include smiling? Can you smile at least? <laughs> you don't have to laugh, but how about a smile? And so something happened and I had no idea what was going on. But I said to Lou, I said, this is the river of God flowing. I said this to him, it's in my book, Into the Fire. I said, we need to make a covenant right now to jump in the river and stay in the river of God. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the river started to take me. Instead of doing things in my own flesh, my own arm of the flesh, I began to just say, okay, show me what the Spirit of God's doing. Which is really interesting because John 5, 19, Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father do. Mm. See, God is moving. We just have to recognize what he's doing. I, I say it this way, recognize and don't organize. Don't try to make things happen, but just recognize what the Spirit of God is doing. How many know the Holy Spirit's God? Do I, am I speaking to the right group here? <laughs> so if the Holy Spirit is God, everything he does is going to be successful. God never does anything that's a failure. He is always successful. And so if you join the Holy Spirit in what the Spirit of God's going to do, then everything is going to break loose. So God wakes me up the, am I on? Yeah. He wakes me up the next month, February, and um, after this experience of revival, and I hear the words 4494. What's that? Well, April the 4th, 1994. When I woke up, I heard the Lord say, I want you to start a new church. And so I was not a pastor for two years. I was itinerating, not a successful itinerant, struggling in depression, <laughs> And now I hear 4494. So I shared this with Sue. I shared this with Lou Engel. And so we decided to have a prayer meeting in the month of March, just praying about a church plant, right? And so we're meeting at my house. I invited like a few of my friends. We invited 15 people, but 30 people showed up. The next week, 65 people showed up in my house. It's not we have a large house, but we're talking about in the living room, family room, kitchen, in the hallway. Third week... 60, I mean, my wife stopped counting after 72 people had crammed into our house. I said, what is going on here? And so I realized we couldn't sustain this. We had to find a building right away. So I called my friend up who was a pastor of a church in Arcadia, a city next to Pasadena. And I said, hey, can we rent your building? He said, well, we use it on Sunday morning, Sunday night, but you could use it on Saturday night. I said, we'll take it. And so now this is 1994. This is before internet, before social media. It's not like we're getting the word out on social media. This is just all word of mouth with the Spirit of God moving and breathing behind it. So the first meeting, public meeting, we had 300 people show up. Now what a difference from six months of planning a church with 20 people, including our children, and now we haven't even started the church and we have already 300 people. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's not by might. It's not by your power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Unless the Lord builds that house, builds your family, builds your business, yeah. those who labor, labor in vain. Yeah. God is for you. If God is for you, who could be against you? He wants you to be successful. But what he wants is intimacy with you. Yeah. He wants you to hear his voice. Yeah. See, the Bible says, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. You notice in John 10, 27, it doesn't say my prophets hear my voice. Of course, prophets hear. It didn't say my apostles hear my voice and they will follow me. It says my sheep yes. hear my voice. How many of you are God's sheep here? Yes. And if you can't raise your hand, I want to give an invitation at the end of the service for you to give your life to Jesus Christ so you could be part of his family and be a sheep for Jesus. My sheep hear my voice. One of my favorite verses is Isaiah 30, verse 21. The Bible says that God's going to whisper behind you. This is the way, walk ye in it. It doesn't say he's going to shout it to you. He's not going to yell it. He's going to whisper. This is the way, walk ye in it, whether to the right or to the left. See, he wants to guide you. It's interesting, the first manifestation of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2.17 and Joel 2.28, in the last days I'll pour out my Spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters will what? 
prophesy. The first manifestation of the outpouring is the prophetic. That's why the prophetic is so foundational. In fact, the church is founded upon apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus being the cornerstone in Ephesians 2.20. But God is speaking. Kierkegaard, a theologian, said this. God is constantly speaking to us, but we're not listening. We're so busy. We're so stressed out. We're so anxious about life. What we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, our job, our family, our relationship, that is really hard for us to hear. And that's why God says, be still and know that I'm God. So everything shifted in 94 for me. And, um, and not only did we start our church, but then God spoke to me through Cindy Jacobs, start HIM, Harvest International Ministry, this apostolic network. Now, you have to understand the context of this. As a Korean, I always look to white people as my leaders, as my covering. I was never leading anything. It was my senior pastor, uh, who was white, American. And, um, and then my apostle, when I was part of that church plan, was a small network of around 20 churches. He was American. And now, Cindy says, you're not to look to another person. I've called you to be an apostle. And you're going to be like Abraham, a father of many, and you will have churches in every single continent. How many know it's time for the Asians to come forth? <laughs> going to hear an amen. And this is in America where it's dominated by WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. Politically, economically, you name it. But you see, there's a shift taking place. The center of gravity is shifting from the white America to internationals to Asians. It is shifting, and it's been shifting because the center of gravity shifted. Now listen, this is important. It began in Jerusalem. Paul wanted to go to Asia, but the Holy Spirit would not allow him. So he went to what's called Macedonia. Remember the Macedonian call? That's Greece. Went to Macedonia. It kept on going westward, went to Rome. And then the center of gravity shifted to Germany in 1517. We call that the Protestant Reformation. Then it shifted to England in 1738. We call that the Great Awakening with George Whitfield and John Wesley. And then it shifted to America with the Second Great Awakening, 1801. And actually, America experienced the Great Awakening too with Edwards, Jonathan Edwards, and Whitfield. But then it shifted again to, from the East Coast to the West Coast in 1906 called Azusa Street Revival. You are here as a result of that shift of the Spirit of God moving westward. And I want to submit to you is shifting from the west coast of America to Asia, where the revival is breaking out and we're talking about it's your time, it's your turn. You are called to be history makers and you need to step up to the plate and fulfill your destiny. Can I hear an amen? Are you awake out there? So we're living the most exciting time. So God said to me, H-I-M. And then he spoke to me through Lou Engel, the call. The call was a prayer gathering to mobilize the, all the young people in Washington, DC, to gather in Washington, D.C. The Promise Keepers had a million. We had a half a million. It was the largest youth prayer meeting in the history of America. Who are we to gather that many young people? By 10 o'clock in the morning, 400,000 people. By 12, 500,000, and then they stopped counting. We raised $10 million by the grace of God to do seven stadium events. And the smallest was 35,000 people. <laughs> by the way, that was in the, the Bible Belt in Dallas at the Cotton Bowl. But the weather had turned so cold, that's why the numbers were so down. We were expecting 80,000, but 35,000 showed up. And so God started to move in our lives, but it was because of what he was saying. And that way, he gets all the glory because it's not by our might, it's not by our power, but by his spirit. And when the Lord does it, he gets all the praise, all the glory. Come on, let's give Jesus all the honor for what he's doing in the Philippines. It's amazing. And so we've been just done by what the Lord's done. He gave us a seminary called Wagner University. He gave us a $32 million building for $13 million, one third the price. I mean, if you see this building, you've got to come to Pasadena and see our building. It's a performance arts building. It's like the Lincoln Center or the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. or Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. 
our building, Ambassador Auditorium, is called the crown jewel of Pasadena. Literally, when you walk in, the ceiling is covered with 24 karat, not 18 karat, not 16 karat, 24 karat gold, right. pure gold. The wall is pure onyx. Onyx is a gemstone. It's not marble, it's onyx. It is the largest quantity of onyx in the whole Western Hemisphere. It's not in some mine, it's in our building. And the value of the chandeliers, you know, just alone is over a million dollars. And God gave us this outrageous building. Cindy Jacobs prophesied, this is a manifestation of the great transfer of wealth the Bible prophesies in Isaiah 60. For internet. What I do do is I do get a cup of coffee, I have to admit. I get a cup of coffee and then I read my Bible. <laughs> and I'm in the Word and I'm in prayer. And then after I pray, then my wife and I pray together. I'm not saying you have to do this, but my wife and I pray every day. We've done this for years. No matter where I'm in the world, you know, I, we pray. Before it would be phone calls, then Skype came along, and thank God for FaceTime, amen? And so we, we talk every day. I've been, on, I've been in Asia for 20 days so far. Every day we talk and pray together on the phone. It's amazing how God answers our prayers. And so that time with the Lord, it just revives me because I pray two prayers every time I pray in my devotion time. I pray Matthew 6, 9 and following. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in my life, in my heart. Revive me. And then the second prayer I pray is, fill me afresh with the Holy Spirit. It's my covenant I made of jumping in the river and staying in the river. See, the Bible says you're not to be drunk with wine, but be Filled with the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 5.18. But that word filled, in the Greek, the grammar is a continual present tense. So the way it really translates is do not be drunk with wine, but be continually filled with the Holy Spirit. How many of you get dehydrated? How many of you need water? See, Charles, Charles Spurgeon, the pastor of the largest church in the 1800s in England, says the reason why we need to be constantly filled is because we leak. Do you leak? <laughs> we all leak. We perspire, especially here in the Philippines. God bless. Can we give a hand for all the worshipers at the dance? I mean, they are just sweating, serving, and worshiping the Lord. It's already hot enough in the Philippines, you know. I had to buy some deodorant. I ran out of deodorant here in the Philippines. The honest truth. <laughs> That's Mark. He took me to a drugstore to, to, to buy it. <laughs> Because I'm sweating like a dog here. <laughs> we perspire, so we need to be hydrated. We need to take in more fluids, right? The same way you will leave the spirit. Jesus felt power leave him when he prayed, when the woman with the issue of blood touched the hem of his garment. The same way you need to be full of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The third thing I want to recommend is cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast your cares on the Lord. You know, during the time we were raising money for the building, we had to raise $13 million in four and a half months. That's a lot of money in a four and a half month period. This is the most. And my accountant, she's one of our pastors, Pastor Andrew would come to me. And other pastors will come to me and say, Pastor, how are we going to raise that money? You know what my answer was? And I said this with all sincerity. I said, I don't have a clue. I don't know. But it's a done deal. Did you hear what I said? I said, I don't know, but it's a done deal. We had the money. Yeah. See, the Bible says in Mark eleven twenty two, 22, whatsoever you desire when you pray, believe you have it, then you shall receive it. It's not I receive it, I'll see it, and then I'll believe. No, God says you've got to believe that you have it. By faith. Amen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. In other words, you have the substance even though you don't see it. It's a conviction. It's a knowing in your knower. And so I didn't know. I didn't know. I did not know how the money was going to happen. Even with four days to go, we were still short $1.3 million. And I remember going before the church that Sunday morning and I was weeping. And the reason why I was crying is because I wanted to thank our people for their sacrificial giving. 
People sold their houses, their cars. Students gave up their tuition just to sew in. People had yard sales, you know, everything from small to big, just so that we could collect the millions of dollars that we needed in such a short time. But here's how I began with the offering. This is our second offering because we still are receiving our tithes and offering for operation expense. It's not like ministry stops when you're having a building fund. On top of the tithes and offering, you're raising extra money. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So I, we had already received our tithes and offering. So I said to the people, I said, I want to just thank you as your pastor. I have never seen such sacrificial giving in the last four and a half months. You are absolutely amazing. And they still didn't know what we're giving money for. Isn't that crazy? Seriously. Four and a half months later, they didn't have a clue. Why are we giving so much money? What are we buying? God's ways are not our ways. You know, he gets all the glory because he really made it so foolish for me to raise that money. But I said to them, I said, um, the good news is that we're almost there to the finish line. The bad news, we still have to raise 1.3 million and I need it by this Thursday. So we're gonna receive another offering. People cheered, they actually cheered. I'm, our church is so amazing because they are blessed to give. So we received the offering and it was less than 100,000. We didn't get the 1.3. Still, we were on fumes and just receiving a second offering of 100,000 after all the millions that we had raised was amazing. So we're counting it right away because we need to know exactly where we're at. I received a phone call and a dear friend of mine said, how much was the offering this, this morning? I said, well, we just counted. It was uh, 80 some thousand dollars. And he said this, he said, Pastor Che, I've been watching you since January when you took up the first offering. And um, when you received the first offering for the, the building in, in, in January, he said, my wife and I want to jump in right away and give sacrificially, but the Lord said, wait. Don't give anything. Wait until the 11th hour, and whatever Pastor Chase still needed, whatever the balance was, you were to pay the rest. So the Lord said it was $2 million, $3 million, It didn't matter. We were to pay the rest. So you need $1.3 I'm going to wire you $1.3 million tomorrow morning, Monday morning, and you have all your money. <laughs> Hallelujah. Now, I had mixed emotions. On one hand, I was really, really happy. The other hand, I wish he had told me this months before that he was going to do this. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but... He was just obeying the Holy Spirit and God was testing me. Yes. Do, do I really trust him? How many know God's a good God? He loves you with an everlasting love. Tell the person next to you, he loves you with an everlasting love. Come on. He wants to so bless you. He wants to do exceeding abundantly beyond all that you ask or think. Luke 12, 32 says, it's a father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. He wants to give you the kingdom. He said, take it is yours. It's not like I'm holding it back. Uh, you're my children. I want to give you your inheritance. I want to give you the kingdom. So cast your care. The last thing I'm going to say is make a covenant to jump in the river of God and stay in the river of God. Now for you it has double meaning because you know maybe God's calling you to be part of the river of God church. <laughs> Seriously, if you're looking for a great church, I want to invite you to be a member of river of God church. <laughs> But I'm talking about what I did in 1994. I realized the Spirit of God's moving. I said, Lord, I don't want to do church the way I was doing church. I was doing it with my flesh, arm of the flesh, selfish ambition, you know, workaholism. And I said, Lord, I want to do what I see the Father do. I want you to show me what you're blessing, and I want to join you. And Lord, I, I don't want to do anything unless you're initiating it. Just recently, last year, 2017, he shocked me with a prophetic word. He said, I want you to plant 10,000 churches in America, in the United States. Now, we have never planted churches in, I mean, we have a lot of churches, but they've been just through just organic church plants, not, not anything intentional like we do in other countries. But the Lord is saying, this country needs revival and reformation the way you're going to do it. See, I believe church planting is the most effective way to fulfill the Great Commission. Because you're ministering holistically, you're ministering to children, to seniors, to singles, to married, so everyone is involved. Marketplace leaders are involved when you plant a church. 10,000 churches. 
And it was really interesting how I heard that. It was a, through a, a television news program, and they were talking about the first President Bush, who was commending all the nonprofit organizations in America, and he called them the 10,000 points of light. When I heard that, I heard the Lord explode, 10,000 churches. Then I thought to myself, it must be just me. I mean, that's pretty ambitious, 10,000 churches. Most churches would plan maybe one or two in their lifetime, 10,000 churches. I'm speaking at a conference, and the other speaker, Jude Falkwar, comes up to me and said, Pastor Che, I have a word for you. The word of the Lord is Genesis chapter 24. That you're going to be like Rebecca, a mother of a thousand and of ten thousand descendants who are going to possess the gates of your enemy. And when he prophesied ten thousand, all of a sudden I said, oh my goodness, God's really serious about me planting ten thousand churches. I mean, it was such a specific word. It was amazing because I was saying, Lord, am I just making this up? Or is this really of you? I need a confirmation. This guy just gives me this prophetic word. But, you know, and at my stage in life as a grandfather, I need to do this like I need another hole in my head. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, because, you know, you could just enjoy ministry, enjoy afterglow, enjoy convergence and the blessing that he has given to me and my family. But the Lord says, listen, I want you to lead the way for HIM in a church planning movement. And I'm prophesying to you guys here in the Philippines that God is asking you to join with me and plant thousands of churches here in the Philippines to see Philippine tur turn into a shaped nation as it was prophesied in our prayer. But not only this nation, but nations. I was just in Japan and when they heard this dream that I had, this word, they said, we want to plant churches in Japan. We want to plant it in Tokyo and Osaka. And they, they said, what can we do? And I said, well, I actually have a church planting seminar. And, um, and uh, you know, I just held that seminar just recently. 200 people showed up, pastors in HIM. It's amazing. There's so much wind behind this. But I'm saying, Lord, I can't do this in my own strength. So I'm going to allow you to do it. And when he does it, it's amazing what he does. It's just... It is, again, he gets the glory, he gets the honor. So I want to impart this to you. I want to impart this doing life, doing ministry out of rest, out of the grace of God, out of the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's all stand up. I should ask the pastor how, how long I had. I didn't even bother to ask him, so forgive me if I went too late. But here's what I want to do. I know in a group this size, there may be some who have never given their hearts to Jesus Christ. I know there's a lot of guests here. We saw the hands that went up. And I want to just encourage you. You know, the Bible says Jesus is our Sabbath. He is the ultimate rest. That's why we started out in Matthew 11, verse 28. Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Now you have to take my yoke upon you. There's still a yoke, but my yoke is easy, my burden is light. For I'm gentle and humble in heart. And you'll find rest for your soul. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, or if you want to come into a fresh, revived commitment to him, I want you to pray this prayer with me, okay? In fact, I'm gonna ask all of you to pray so we can support those who are making that first time commitment or rededication. Can we all pray this together? Because this is a prayer that we want to be revived in.